ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network, Atypical Antipsychotics, Indications, and How to Monitor. Your host, Gavin Bates, will begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network and Macomb County Community Mental Health. This learning session is funded by a Michigan Department of Health and Human Services Innovation Grant. I would like to introduce you to today's presenter, Dr. John Bryles. Dr. Bryles completed his medical school training at Wayne State University School of Medicine in 2006. He went on to complete a psychiatry residency at Henry Ford Hospital in 2009 and a fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry at Wayne State University in 2011. Dr. Bryles practiced for two years as an outpatient child and adolescent psychiatrist at a Henry Ford Health System clinic before becoming medical director of behavioral health at Molina Healthcare of Michigan in 2013. Since joining, he has acted as the psychiatric consultant in various medical rounds and also presented on the subject at the healthcare integration kickoff in Oakland County, as well as presenting and leading discussion at three primary care provider forums. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Bryles. Thank you so much, Gavin. I hope everybody can hear me loud and clear. Um, so today's topic is atypical antipsychotics, perhaps not the most interesting of topics, but certainly a very important one uh, as atypical antipsychotics uh, continue to be prescribed um, a lot um, and for a lot of different indications. Um, and I'm very certain that uh, all of you have come across patients that are taking uh, an atypical antipsychotic. So, uh, my disclosure statement essentially, I do not, uh, I cannot identify any potential conflicts of interest. So, my objectives for today, first of all, to briefly discuss the history and pharmacology of atypical antipsychotics, discuss the indications, and I'll include FDA and off label uh, uses uh, for prescribing these medications as well as to discuss how to properly monitor patients that are prescribed these medications. So it wouldn't be a complete presentation uh, on atypical antipsychotics if I did not at least mention the typical or first-generation antipsychotics. Uh, these are the older antipsychotics, um, most common examples that probably many of you have heard of. Um, and, and throughout the, the presentation uh, this afternoon, I will refer to these medications using brand names and generic names, probably more so the brand names since those are the names most folks are familiar with. Haldol and Haloperidol, Polixin, Fufenazine, uh, and by the way, both of these medications are available in long-acting injectable forms, which is an important point. Thorazine or Chlorpromazine, uh, which was actually the first antipsychotic used for psychiatric reasons, uh, reasons introduced in 1951. The older antipsychotic medications are typically seen as good at treating the positive symptoms of psychosis, perhaps not uh, the negative symptoms. Uh, positive symptoms include hallucinations, delusions, and disorganized thinking. We'll talk more about symptoms as the presentation goes along today. Uh, as a group, more common side effects it includes dry mouth, muscle rigidity, cramping, tremors, weight gain, although as we'll talk in much greater detail, uh, weight gain is less common in the um, traditional first-generation antipsychotics compared to the newer atypicals. Also, extrapyramidal symptoms, again, uh, this, in this case, more, to, more common than in the atypicals. Tardive dyskinesia and neuroleptic malignant syndrome. We will touch upon these uh, later in the presentation today. So, what are the atypical antipsychotics? Well, they're also known as second generation antipsychotics. And this term really only refers to the timeline of when these medications came out. There's no scientific uh, uh, basis for that. Uh, they were developed due to concerning and intolerable extrapyramidal side effects that I had mentioned, uh, typical of the older antipsychotics. Um, the term atypical really just means 
that there is a lower propensity to induce these uh, extrapyramidal side effects compared to the older medications. So Clozrel or, or Clozapine, um, the first one introduced back in 1971, but interestingly did not receive an FDA approval until 1989. Why the reason for that delay? Well, in the mid-70s, some case reports came out of patient deaths related to agranulocytosis. Clozril is a very effective, actually there's evidence that it's the most effective antipsychotic medication available, but it has these associated serious side effects, including agranulocytosis, also myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, and seizures. It's also a cumbersome medication to for patients to take and for physicians to prescribe because of frequent blood draws. So after Fosoril, similar antipsychotics were then developed and became available uh, starting in the early 90s. First one was Risperdal in 1993. So a little bit about the pharmacology. Uh, all antipsychotics block D2 receptors in the brain. Um, Thought to decrease psychotic symptoms due to uh, these medications' effects on the mesolimbic pathway, and then side effects are thought to be due to blocking these D2 receptors and other pathways in the brain. For example, the extrapyramidal side effects and the nigrostriatal pathway. Also, talking about the atypical antipsychotics, uh, they also block serotonin receptors. So 5-HT2A, 2C, 1A, and this is what's thought to affect um, mood symptoms, symptoms of depression and mania. So here is the full list of atypical antipsychotics that are available in the United States today. There are 11 now, uh, including the most recent one, uh, Rexalti, just FDA approved in July. Um, I'm going to go through each one individually. Um, I'm going to be pointing out FDA indications, I'm going to be pointing out off-label indications and provide some evidence for those uses when I'm able to. I'm going to talk about um, metabolic concerns and drug-drug interactions a little bit for each one, and also try to share with you some of the unique properties for each one. So without further ado, and I'm just going in uh, alphabetical order here, starting with Abilify or Aripiprazole. Abilify has FDA approval for treatment of schizophrenia in both adults and adolescents ages 13 to 17 with a target dose of 10 to 30 milligrams. Um, I'm going to stop on this slide uh, just as a refresher for some of the core symptoms of these disorders. So schizophrenia, uh, I mean that as a primary psychotic disorder, so hallmark symptoms of psychosis your positive symptoms of psychosis, things like hallucinations, so seeing things, hearing things that aren't really there, delusions or fixed false beliefs, also uh, your hallmark disorganized thinking, disorganized speech patterns, and then also your negative symptoms, so things like a patient being withdrawn, isolative, poverty of thought, poverty of speech. Um, Bipolar 1 disorder, so treatment of both acute manic and mixed episodes. So when I say manic or mania, I'm talking about an increase in energy, often despite a decreased need for sleep, perhaps no sleep, uh, an increase in risk-taking behaviors, irritability. Mixed episodes, meaning combination of manic and depressive symptoms at the same time. So, Abilify is FDA approved for treatment of adults um, with a target dose of 15 to 30 milligrams for children ages 10, uh, 10 to 17, 10 to 30 milligrams. Also approved for maintenance treatment of bipolar 1 um, as an adjunctive along with lithium or uh, valproate, which is Depakote. Major depressive disorder as an adjunctive treatment with antidepressant medication. Uh, for adults, target dose of 5 to 15 milligrams. For autism, uh, irritability uh, associated with autism. This is for children and adolescents 6 to 17 with a target dose of 5 to 15 milligrams. 
Uh, and finally, agitation associated with schizophrenia or mania. Abilify comes in an intramus uh, intramuscular injection form. This is a PRN uh, indication. 5.25 to 9.75 milligrams, up to a total of 30 milligrams in 24 hours. And this is really more for your inpatient and emergency department setting. Abilify has uh, uh, several off-label uses. Uh, there's actually mo uh, modest evidence for tr treatment of psychosis and agitation associated with dementia. Borderline personality has lower evidence, but Abilify is certainly used for that. Uh, anxiety disorders, not much evidence, just two open-label trials. Also used for ADHD, uh, depression, monotherapy, so Abilify by itself, and eating disorders, but there are no, uh, no trials for these conditions. Abilify is unique um, compared to the other atypical antipsychotics, so with the exception of the newest one that just came out in July. It's a partial agonist of the D2 receptor as opposed to an antagonist. Um, it has a long-acting injectable form called Abilify Mintena and also an orally disintegrating tablet called the Disc Melt. Uh, in terms of metabolism, um, caution should be used and the, the dose should actually be reduced to half the normal dose uh, with strong inhibitors of cytochrome P3A4, uh, as well as uh, inhibitors of cytochrome P2D6, uh, which includes fluoxetine and peroxetine, that's Prozac and Paxil, uh, and Abilify is certainly uh, prescribed very commonly with, with antidepressants. The dose should actually be doubled with uh, carbamazepine or Tegretol, uh, which is a cytochrome P3A4 inducer. Abilify is a pregnancy category B. There's only one other atypical antipsychotic we're going to talk about today that's a category B. So the potential benefits should outweigh potential risk prescribing Abilify during pregnancy. Clozero, and Clozero is going to come up a few times today. Clozero or clozapine. It has an FDA indication for treatment-resistant schizophrenia. Treatment resistant because it's really a last resort kind of medication. Um, approved for treatment of adults, target dose of 300 to 450 milligrams with a maximum dose of 900 milligrams. It's also FDA approved uh, to reduce the risk of recurrent suicidal behavior in patients with schizophrenia and also schizoaffective disorder. Um, the simplest way to think about what schizoaffective is schizoaffective disorder is yeah, primarily schizophrenia plus a mood disorder, either bipolar disorder or major depression. It's a primary uh, psychotic disorder, but also has those mood disorder uh, symptoms. Um, again, approved for adults with the same target dose, 300 to 450 milligrams, maximum dose of 900. Clodril is used off-label for treatment of bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, also used in children and adolescents with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, but again, because of its side effect profile, used as a last resort medication when other medications have been tried and failed. Caution should be used when prescribed along medications um, that are uh, 1A2 inhibitors. Uh, Contraindicated in patients with a history of taking clozapine uh, that had clozapine induced agranulocytosis, which is an absolute neutral count of less than 500, or severe granulocytopenia. Clozapine is a pregnancy category C in animal studies has demonstrated developmental toxicity, including possible teratogenic effects in rats and rabbits. Moving on to Geodon or Zeprazidone, it has FDA indications for treatment of schizophrenia in adults. Dose is, uh, target dose is 20 to 80 milligrams twice daily. Also indicated for bipolar 1 disorder, both acute manic and mixed episodes in adults, 40 to 80 milligrams DID. Also maintenance treatment of bipolar 1 um, and adjunctive with lithium or Depakote. Also proof for agitation associated with schizophrenia comes in an uh, intramuscular injectable PRN form, 
10 to 20 milligrams up to a total of 40 milligrams uh, in a 24-hour period. It is used off-label uh, in children and adolescents with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, irritability associated with autism, bipolar depression, major depression, also anxiety, including uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Geodon uh, is special in that it should definitely be taken with food. There's one other medication we'll talk about that's the same, and that's because absorption is increased up to two times when taken with food. And I believe the recommendation is 300 calories or more, so it doesn't have to be a large meal, but typically Geodon is taken uh, with breakfast and dinner. This is also unique to Geodon. Geodon is contraindicated in patients with a known history of QT prolongation, recent myocardial infarction, and uncompensated heart failure. Caution should be used uh, along with uh, 3A4 inducers like Pegritol and Cetaconazole. It is a pregnancy category C. Uh, in animal studies, there's been uh, developmental toxicity demonstrated, including possible teratogenic effects at doses similar to human therapeutic doses. And after iloperidol uh, is a newer atypical antipsychotic, only has FDA approval for treatment of schizophrenia, acute psychotic symptoms in adults with a target dose of 6 to 12 milligrams BID, uh, is used off-label for maintenance treatment of schizophrenia uh, and probably uh, starting to be used more uh, for bipolar disorder, perhaps in the child and adolescent populations as well. Uh, FANATs have a modest increase in the QTC interval, so caution uh, should be used, especially if there's a medication also being prescribed that may prolong the QTC interval. Caution should be used alongside medications that are 2D6 inhibitors as well as 3A4 inhibitors. FANAP is a pregnancy category C with no adequate or well-controlled studies. Invega or paloperidol is FDA approved for treatment of schizophrenia, both acute and maintenance treatment in adults with a target dose of 6 to 12 milligrams. Adolescents 12 to 17 years old, target dose of 3 to 12 milligrams, and also for schizoaffective disorder in adults, as both monotherapy, so in beta by itself, and adjunctive treatment along with lithium or Depakote, target dose of 6 to 12 milligrams. And beta is also used off-label fairly commonly for bipolar spectrum disorders. Invega does come in a long-acting injectable form called the Invega Sustena. Um, it is a cousin to Risperdal, meaning uh, the, the major active metabolite uh, of Risperdal is Um An initiation of uh, Tigrosol, which is a strong inducer of 3A4, the dose of Invega should be reevaluated and increased if necessary, and same with other strong inducers of 3A4. Pregnancy category C for Invega uh, did cause developmental toxicity, but not was not found to be teratogenic in rats and rabbits. Latuda or lorazidone is another one of the newer atypical antipsychotics. It has FDA approval for schizophrenia, both acute and maintenance treatment of adults, with a target range of 40 to 160 milligrams, and also bipolar depression, both monotherapy by itself and adjunctive treatment along with lithium or Depakote. Target range in adults is 20 to 100 milligrams. Latuda is used off-label for maintenance treatments of uh, bipolar depression, uh, also for bipolar mania and mixed episodes. And I would also add that I think it's being prescribed more commonly in the child and adolescent populations, um, probably more so because Latuda seems to have less propensity for weight gain and other metabolic effects, especially compared to the older atypical antipsychotics. Like Geodon, Latuda should definitely be taken with food uh, again, like Gidon, absorption is increased up to two times. 
should not be used actually with strong 3A4 inhibitors or inducers, so like Tegresol or carbamazepine. Latuda is a pregnancy category B. It's the only one um, along with Abilify. Everything else is category C. So, uh, Risperdal or Risperidone. This was the second one to come on the market after Clozero. Uh, this was 1993, so it's been around a while. It has FDA approval for treatment of schizophrenia in adults. Um, Target dose is 4 to 16 milligrams. For adolescents, uh, 13 to 17 years old, target dose is 1 to 6 milligrams. For treatment of bipolar disorder, both acute manic and mixed episodes, in adults, the target dose is 1 to 6 milligrams. For children 10 to 17 years, 0 0.5 to 6 milligrams. It's also approved for uh, treatment of irritability and autism. The children 5 to 17 years old with a target range of 0 0.5 to 3 milligrams. Crispardol has several off-label uses, uh, again, probably because it's been around so long. Um, for treatment of major depression, adjunctive, so along with an antidepressant medication, actually has moderate to high evidence that, that it's effective. Also for associated behaviors, agitation, and psychotic symptoms in dementia, Again, moderate to high evidence, despite the black box warning, which we will get to shortly. Um, for generalized anxiety disorder, it has low evidence. Um, however, for treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, along with an SSRI, it does have moderate to high evidence. Uh, same with post-traumatic stress disorder. It is typically, well, not typically, but fairly frequently used uh, for ADHD and Tourette's uh, in children, but low evidence for those. Risperdal is available in a long-acting uh, injectable called the Risperdal Consta, also available in an oral solution, as well as an orally disintegrating tablet called the Risperdal M-Tab. Not specifically unique to Risperdal, but seems to be more commonly seen with Risperdal, and that is hyperprolactinemia which can lead to sexual side effects, amenorrhea, or a uh, woman's period stopping, uh, gynecomastia, or breast tissue growth, or galacteria, which is actual milk production. Risperdal should be reduced when used in combination with 2D6 inhibitors. Risperdal is a pregnancy category C. Actually, there's no adequate or well-controlled studies, which is a surprise to me since it's been around for quite some time. Safras or astenapine, uh, also one of the newer atypical antipsychotics. And when I say newer, I mean within the last five to six years. Um, Safras has an FDA indication for the treatment of schizophrenia, both acute and maintenance treatment in adults, with a target range of 5 to 10 milligrams twice a day. Also for bipolar mania, as monotherapy or adjunctive treatment along with lithium or Depakote. This is an adult um, target, dose of 5 to 10 milligrams, BID. And for children, 10 to 17 years, the target dose of 2.5 to 10 milligrams, BID. Staphis is used uh, fairly commonly off-label for treatment of bipolar maintenance, not just uh, uh, the acute phase. Staphis is available in a sublingual tablet. Um, should be uh, used cautiously with medications that both inducers and inhibitors of 2D6. It is a pregnancy category C with no human studies. Seroquel or quetiapine, also been around since the late 90s. Uh, it has uh, several FDA indications and uh, off-label uses. It's FDA approved for treatment of schizophrenia, both acute and maintenance treatment in adults with a dose range of 150 to 750 milligrams for adolescents 13 to 17 years uh, with a target range actually uh, higher, 400 to 800 milligrams. For bipolar mania, both monotherapy and adjunctive treatment along with lithium or Depakote in adults and children 13 to 17 years 
with a target dose of 400 to 600 milligrams. For bipolar depression, um, as monotherapy, 300 to 600 milligrams. And bipolar maintenance, as adjunctive treatment along with lithium or Depakote, 400 to 800 milligrams. The Seroquel XR form also has an FDA indication for treatment of major depressive disorder uh, as an adjunct to antidepressant medication, a dose of 150 to 300 milligrams. There's moderate evidence for treatment of generalized anxiety disorder with Seroquel, actually. For obsessive compulsive disorder, the evidence is low uh, in contrast to Risperdal, which had moderate to high evidence. Um, is used to treat associated psychosis and agitation and dementia. Also, um, psychosis related to Parkinson's disease. As I mentioned, Seroquel does come in an extended release form. Seroquel is especially uh, sensitive. Should be reduced to one sixth the original dose prescribed alongside a 3A4 inhibitor or increased up to five times the original dose uh, with chronic treatment of a potent 3A inducer. Seroquel is a pregnancy category C with no adequate well-controlled studies. Again, surprising since it's been around since the late 90s. Diprexa or lanzapine, also been around since the late 90s, has FDA approval for treatment of schizophrenia, uh, both acute and maintenance in adults and adolescents, 13 to 17 years. Target dose of 10 to 20 milligrams. Also bipolar disorder, acute and maintenance treatment, and in mixed episodes. Both monotherapy by itself or adjunctives along with lithium or Depco. In adults and children, 17, uh, sorry, 10 to 17 years. Uh, target dose of 10 to 20 milligrams. Also approved for agitation, agitation associated with schizophrenia and bipolar mania comes in an uh, intramuscular injectable form, so PRN indication, uh, 10 milligrams, a total of 30 milligrams uh, in a 24-hour period, space two to four hours apart. Diprexa is used off-label as depression augmentation with uh, an antidepressant for anxiety, panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder for rats. Uh, also associated um, agitation, psychosis, and dementia. Zyprexa is available in an oral disintegrating tablet called the Zyprexa Zytus. There's also a special combination form, Symbiex, which is uh, Zyprexa Prozac combination, um, approved for bipolar 1 depression in adults and children, as well as treatment resistant depression in adults. Caution should be used alongside a 1A2 inducer or inhibitor. Zyprexa is a pregnancy category C, um, but no evidence of teratogenicity in rats or rabbits. The newest atypical antipsychotic to receive FDA approval is Rexalti or Rexpoprazole. Just approved by, F by the FDA on July 10th of this year for schizophrenia and major depression augmentation in adults. It's actually similar to Abilify, except that it also affects two norepinephrine alpha receptors, which is unique to this medication. Um, appears to have less affinity and activity at the D2 receptor compared to Abilify. Possible that we may see less, less side effects with this medication. Metabolized by the same enzymes as Abilify, so it has the same dosing recommendations. Recommended for major depression augmentation to start at just 0.5 milligrams to a target of 1 milligram. Schizophrenia starting at 1 milligram to a target of 2 milligrams. Um, I've also heard that they're seeking approval for treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder, which would be unique to this medication also. I'm not going to go over this whole slide, but just so you know, um, that there are various forms available, available depending on the medication, liquid form, dissolvable or sublingual tablets, um, as I had mentioned, uh, intramuscular PRN forms, and long acting injectables. Uh, I want to point out the Zyprexone Velprev, although it's available in the United States, 
I've never prescribed it. I don't think I've ever seen it prescribed because uh, of the restricted distribution program. So I wanted to share with you, this is important, the black, the black box warnings that we find on the atypical, atypical antipsychotic medications, starting with the elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis. There are warnings of increased mortality and cerebrovascular adverse events, including strokes. But I would like to point out that this is fairly controversial. There's a 2013 article in the American Journal of Psychiatry that argued that the concerns here, the morbidity and mortality, may actually be more related to the mental illness or dementia severity and not to the medications themselves. Also, the warning of suicidal thoughts and behaviors in adolescents and young adults. Now, this is only if the uh, antipsychotic medication has an FDA approval for treatment of depression. Um, remember, this warning was, was specifically for uh, antidepressant medications, and even with that, it's, it's, it's quite controversial. Uh, the warning specifically says antidepressants increase the risk compared to placebo of suicidal thinking and behavior or suicidality. I want to stress that. We're talking about suicidal thinking and behavior or suicidal gestures. We're not talking about uh, completed suicides. But this is in children, adolescents, and young adults in short-term studies. So getting more into monitoring side effects um, for patients that are taking these medications. Starting with the extrapyramidal side effects for EPS. Now remember, these side effects are definitely less commonly seen in the atypical antipsychotics compared to the older typical antipsychotics. So what am I talking about when I say EPS? Dystonias, or prolonged and normal contractions of muscle groups. Parkinsonism, so not Parkinson's disease, but a symptom complex that resembles Parkinson's disease, including things like tremors, slow movements, impaired speech, muscle rigidity, akathisia, which is a feeling of inner restlessness and a compelling need to be in constant motion. You can observe this in a patient, a patient that just can't sit still or is pacing back and forth, but be cautious because that could also be part of the actual uh, psychiatric disorder itself. Part of dyskinesia, which is an involuntary movement of the face, jaw, and thumb, but it can affect uh, the, the limbs or digits even. This is usually seen with long-term use of antipsychotic medications. It is potentially irreversible. However, if you stop the antipsychotic that is causing it, sometimes it does remit. There's also some evidence, or although it's low evidence, that benzodiazepines like Ativan may help reduce this. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It's a rare condition, but potentially fatal, so very important to note. It may present with a fever, muscle rigidity, altered mental status, evidence of autonomic instability in general, so things like irregular pulse and blood pressure, diaphoresis, cardiac dysrhythmia, perhaps. You can see an elevated creatinine phosphokinase, so you should probably check that. Uh, rhabdomyolysis, acute renal failure even. Not really a specific treatment for us, but certainly if this is suspected or diagnosed, you definitely want to discontinue the antipsychotic immediately. And then it's really just intensive symptomatic treatment, and monitoring of the patient, as well as obviously treating any other kind of concomitant um, serious medical problem. Orthostatic hypotension is fairly commonly seen with these medications. That's a drop in blood pressure upon suddenly standing or laying down, suddenly sitting up. Uh, it can be associated with dizziness, tachycardia, bradycardia, even syncope. Somnolence, um, sedation, very commonly seen with these medications, probably all of them. Um, often dose-related with these medications. Um, because of the side effect, another reason to be very cautious prescribing to the elderly and patients with dementia who are already at risk of falls. 
I want to spend a little more time on, on metabolic changes, which again are more commonly seen with atypical antipsychotics compared to the typical antipsychotics. We kind of had a, have a trade-off with the atypical antipsychotics, whereas although we don't see the EPS side effects as much, we, we see these metabolic changes more frequently. So I'm talking about hyperglycemia and or diabetes, dyslipidemia, and weight gain. I wanted to share this table with you, which essentially shows you all the atypical antipsychotics except the latest one, uh, Rigzalti. Um, it's kind of interesting because, and this is a, more of a general trend, not exact, but when you look at this, the, in general, the older atypical antipsychotics are really the worst offenders when it comes to weight gain, dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia. The newer atypical antipsychotics in general seem to be uh, not as bad when it comes to these. Um, as you can see here, uh, Clozeril and Zyprexa are without a doubt the worst offenders. Uh, I would also like to point out that uh, these effects appear to be even more drastic in the child and adolescent population. I'm not going to go over the entire uh, table here, um, but I wanted to share with you this very important guideline. This is the most updated uh, coming from the ADA and APA. Um, and I wanted to point out that these are non-fasting labs, which is important because this really helps with uh, the convenience factor. We all know how difficult it is to ask these people to fast, especially those with severe chronic mental illness. Um, so just to point out some things here, you know, obviously you want to get a full medical and family history, including cardiovascular disease uh, initially. Um, weight, and of course you need height to keep track of BMI, but this, this should really be done at baseline, and then again at four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, and then quarterly after that. Weight circumference initially and then annually. Hemoglobin A1C, random blood glucose, blood pressure, non-fasting total cholesterol and HDL cholesterol, all of these should be done at baseline, 12 weeks, and then annually after that. I uh, want to draw your attention to the cutoffs here. Um, these cutoffs you really want to pay close attention to because uh, intervention may be required. You know, that may be um, switching to a different antipsychotic. It may be prescribe a medication to treat um, these problems. It may be referral to a specialist to address these, these problems. I um, also wanted to make note of the 10-year risk um, under the, the cholesterol parameter. Um, there are uh, easy to access online calculators uh, to do that very thing. So there are several strategies available to help minimize these metabolic effects, especially the atypical antipsychotics, healthy lifestyle interventions. So this may require referring your patients to nutritionist or dietitian. Um, as I mentioned, switching to a lower risk antipsychotic in some cases. Uh, there's also options to treat the actual problems themselves. So addition of medications that may lower body weight and or lipid and glucose parameters. Um, in particular, metformin has shown pretty good evidence for weight reduction, lowering triglycerides, and lowering hemoglobin uh, A1C. Um, and, and this is important to know because sometimes you have patients that have done extremely well on a specific antipsychotic medication. They don't want to come off it. Um, the physician doesn't want them to come off it. And so sometimes this is what you have to do. Uh, again, Clausural is coming up again, and, and I realize that a lot of you probably won't be prescribing and monitoring Clausural, but if you're in a primary care setting, certainly in an emergency department setting, you're going to have patients that show up that are taking Clausural. So it's important to note that, um, as I mentioned, Clausural is a cumbersome medication to prescribe and monitor. It requires an initial uh, CBC with differential. The absolute neutral count must be equal to or greater to 2,000. The white blood cell count must be equal to or greater to 3,500 in order to even initiate it. 
and then to continue prescribing Fosro, the absolute neutral count and white blood cell count must be monitored weekly for the first six months, and then every two weeks for the next six months, and then every four weeks beyond that. Um, so, um, cumbersome for patients to take, cumbersome for physicians to monitor. Um, you also obviously want to be sure that these patients have adequate support in place as far as family and other resources in the community so they can even take this medication. So, so in, in summary, we've discussed briefly the history and pharmacology of atypical antipsychotics. We've discussed indications both FDA approved and off-label uh, for prescribing these medications. And we've discussed how to properly monitor patients prescri uh, that are prescribed atypical antipsychotics. So, at this point, I want to thank you very much for your participation. Uh, I'm going to hand it back over to Gavin at this point. Thank you, Dr. Bryle. That was great. Um, I wanted to remind everyone that this presentation will be available on our Lake Superior QIN YouTube page within the next week. At this time, um, I would ask that WebEx bring up the polling questions um, and everyone to take a moment to let us know how we did by filling these out. All right, um, we can open it up for Q&A now. Um, so please, operator, give the instructions for how to get in the queue. So ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions at this time, please press the number one key. Again, if you have any questions at this time, please press the number one key. Dr. and Gavin, there's no one in queue at this time. All right, why don't we uh, hold on um, for about another five minutes and then uh, maybe get some uh, questions in the queue. Kevin, yeah, I'm also happy to answer any questions. Uh, I'm sorry, Doctor. I do have one right now on the line from um, Becky Great. from the nu Nucleus um, Clinic. Please go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. No, I don't have a question at this time. I apologize. No problem. Thank you. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please press the number one key. Yes, I have one from TANS um, from CHTI. Please go ahead. Hi. I was under the impression that um, doses of Seroquel to treat psychosis um, needed to be higher, like around 900 to 1,200 milligrams. Is that inaccurate? Yeah, not according to what's FDA approved, but I will tell you in the community, you're absolutely right, especially in uh, inpatient psychiatric settings. It, it typically, you do see higher doses of seroquel prescribed for schizophrenia and primary psychotic disorders. But, but yeah, it is. It, Interesting. I, I'm not sure. You know, again, those FDA approved, uh, approved indications are based on specific studies, but you're right. What you see in the community is definitely different. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's no one in queue at this time. All right. Well, um, if there are no more questions, we can go ahead and end it a little early today. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Excuse me, Gavin. Oh. Um, Karen from the Henry Ford Center would like to speak with you. All right, great. Someone from the Henry from Henry Ford, Karen, did you press the number one key? I don't think they did. They had a group of 25 people. Um, I have one question. Um, there was a person when I um, answered them. They wanted to know if they would be able to get the uh, the slides or something information. Um, the um, we will have the uh, recording of this webinar uh, posted to www.youtube.com slash lsqin. If you look in the chat right now, I posted a link, um, and that'll be on in the next week.
Yeah, but I, I also personally don't have a problem with sharing our slides if, if, if that's, uh, that's something we can do if you like that. Typically what we'll do is um, we'll not only post a recording, but we'll also put a link to the slides in the description of the recording. Great. Okay. Um, I see a question on chat from a Grant Brown, I believe. Um, I, I do see that. Thank you, Gavin. Okay. Um, but it's, I don't know exactly what the question is. So. I, I think, uh, well, let me see if I understand. Hopefully I do. The question is about genetic testing. Is it a practical application for this patient population? Well, I guess I'll just speak to it in general terms. I, I think this is possibly the way of the future. At this point, evidence is not strong enough to be doing genetic testing regularly to see who's going to be a candidate for a certain medication. Um, and that's certainly not unique to atypical antipsychotics. I know it's being done more and more frequently, but the, the evidence is really not there just yet. I hope that answered that question. Um, Karen came back in queue. I don't know if they actually have a, um, a question, but I'm going to open the line. Karen, um, from, hello, does anyone have a question from this room from the hearing Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, good. We were having microphone difficulty. I my apologies. If you can um, have them to speak, if you can move away, maybe we can hear your question because we have everyone in the background right now. Maybe you can type it into the chat function. Yeah, or, or, or designate one person to speak into the microphone. Okay, they said they'll type it in. Okay. All right. Sounds like they're having fun there. Hey, yeah, that's a, that's a big gathering. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Brout, can you advance the slides uh, one more? Sure, no problem. Sorry. <laughs> I included a, a couple more slides on the end of your presentation, uh, just some quick announcements. Um, just reminding everyone that the recording will be available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash LSQIN, and uh, a reminder to fill out the evaluation. Okay. All right, so I'm looking at... The, uh, the chat room question, this is from a pediatrician, uh, would like to know how often patients should be seeing the psychiatrist. As a pediatrician, I hope you mean child psychiatrist, uh, when they're on an antipsychotic medication, and also how often the pediatrician should be doing CBC, lipid profile, hemoglobin A1C. Um, great questions. Um, uh, I'm going to go the easy route and say, as far as how often they should see the child psychiatrist, the answer is it depends. Um, I always encourage pediatricians and primary care providers in general to be treating basic mild psychiatric conditions that they're comfortable treating and or psychiatric conditions that are very stable. Um, and, and this really is going to depend on the pediatrician or primary care provider. Um, if you have a child that, uh, you know, is not doing well from a behavioral standpoint or not doing well on medication or having concerning side effects, you know, I encourage you to make sure that child is seeing the child psychiatrist frequently. It's kind of hard to comment on how frequently that is because it depends on the case. Um, as far as a child being on an antipsychotic, how we should be monitoring. Um, you know, I, I, I would say the guidelines that I shared with you from AD and AT is a good place to start. 
Off the top of my head, I don't know if there is a different set of guidelines for children and adolescents, um, but essentially that you should be checking with the profiles and hemoglobin A1Cs, you know, at least at the same frequency that you would with adults. So I hopefully answer those questions. Um, I have one question I see in here from a Carrie. Can we take that? Is it possible? Okay. Carrie from Medilodge of Yale, please go ahead. Carrie, did you have a question? Perhaps you're muted because we can't hear you if you're speaking. Did you have a question? Your line is open now. No, I have no questions. Maybe it was an accident. Okay, sorry about that. Are there no more questions in queue? I don't see any in the chat either. All right. Well, um, I wanted to uh, also remind everyone um, that we have a couple of upcoming webinars. Uh, first, our Behavioral Health Initiative kickoff is on September 15th. Um, this will give an overview of the goals and requirements of our new initiative entitled Improving Identification of Depression and Alcohol Use Disorder in Primary Care and Care Transitions for Behavioral Health Conditions. Um, this will be at uh, or on Tuesday, September 15th at 12.30 Eastern. Um, you can go ahead and, and go to lsqin.org to uh, register for that right now. And um, also, uh, the next day on September 16th, uh, we'll be having a webinar on depression and chronic disease, also featuring Dr. John Bryles, uh, who will discuss how behavioral health conditions have an impact upon chronic disease states. So if that's all the questions, I'd like to thank you again, uh, Dr. Bryles, for uh, your presentation today. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Yes, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this completes your conference call. You may all disconnect, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.